A few Japanese soldiers, I have read, still lurk in the bush on the islands. Every now and then one emerges. It would be just my luck to be the victim of the last Banzai charge. That is ridiculous, of course. Still, I am nervous. The fact is that I have no idea of what I shall find out there. Then the old war songs begin in my head. All my life I have had one tune or another running through my mind, and I have never been able to control them. Since our takeoff, this internal Muzak has been playing the appropriately assuasive I will be seeing you. But now there is a change on the brain's record player. Lyrics stifled long ago come crowding back first to the tune of McNamara's band. Just now we are all rehearsing for another big affair, we will take another island, and the Japanese will all be there. And bless them all, bless them all, as back to our foxholes we crawl. Then, to the same air, mispronouncing the name of a shocking battle. Oh, we sent for MacArthur to come to Tarawa. But General MacArthur said no. He gave as the reason. It was not the season. Besides, there was no USO. Then, to the tune of Embraceable You, replace me. I can't go home without you. And I don't want no more Marine Corps. Gee, Mom, I want to go right back to Quantico. Gee, Mom, I want to go home. And the haunting. Say a prayer for your pal on Guadalcanal. He needs God's help, it's true. What, I suddenly wonder, am I doing here? I am headed toward places I vowed never to see again, toward excessive vegetation, away from gentle New England's forsythia, pussy willows, laurel, lilac. I could be deep in the leather chair by my Connecticut fireplace, reading Muriel Spark or Peter de Vries, or listening to Tchaikovsky's musical euphemism of 1812 combat. I don't need this, says the old man in me. Yes, you do, the sergeant says grimly. And as our silvery tube climbs above rough weather at 35,000 feet, the sergeant takes over. Hawaii was the destination of my first airplane ride, but we were coming from the opposite direction, from Saipan, with stops at Guam and Johnston Island. It was a long flight, about 4,000 miles, and the best our C-54 could do, with all four engines toiling a whoomp, a whoomp, a whoomp, was under 265 miles per hour. There were 25 of us, all on litters. Apparently this had always been a flying ambulance. The bulkheads of its long, cigar-shaped ward were whitewashed, the deck was rubber, trays bearing tubes and syringes were screwed in place, and everything had that unmistakable smell of medicinal chemicals. At least that is my recollection. I was not an altogether reliable witness. I was weaning myself from morphine, the weaning had not been my idea in the beginning. I had been on a half grain a day. Then an army medical officer had cut it off completely, leaving me to cold turkey. I could have returned to the drug here, but having gone this far without it, I was determined to finish the job. The doctor on the plane knew all this. He thought the cold turkey decision had been a mistake. He kept asking me if I needed something. I shook my head each time and turned my face into the pillow. After he had left, the withdrawal routine would start again. Yawning, shaking, sweating, cramps, nausea, tears, goose flesh, a runny nose and the chuck horrors. Every hour one of the four corpsmen aboard would check my systolic pressure and my rectal temperature, tracing the rising curves on my chart with his rubber finger. If they went too high, the doctor might give me a fix despite my protests. Do you need something? No, I am fine. The doctor looked like an Arab. He had that swarthy complexion and ropey moustache. He was balding and trying to hide the fact by brushing his hair where it did not want to go. The result was that he looked as though he had just risen hastily from bed. His skin was coarse and pitted with acne scars. When he leaned over me I could see the shadowy hollows and recesses in his face and the network of veins around his irises. At less than a foot my vision was fine. Past that it blurred. The bandages had been removed from my eyes just before we took off, and in addition I suffered from the dilation of all addicts. Any bright light made the pupils smart. Luckily the lights here were dim. I could see enough to know that I was not the sickest man aboard. Aft of me was a man with a head wound. It was tightly bandaged, but blood was seeping through the gauze. I could hear the unsteady dripping on the gizmo that was feeding him intravenously. On the port side of the aisle a lieutenant had a chest wound. He was raggedly sucking in air. Below him was the victim of a kamikaze, a chief petty officer bound up like a mummy. His hands were free, however. 
each had an anchor tattooed on the back of it. The anchors kept clawing at one another, as though trying to link up. My blindness had been from shock, and it was passing. My biggest problems just then were a splitting headache and several pieces of shrapnel deep in my back. Shrapnel and something else. The doctor studied my X-ray and gave a little cry. Why, that looks like a piece of tibia, a shin bone. It is. Japanese? One of my men. He moved on. Then the real pain would prowl up, a fat corpsman who seemed to think we all ought to be clowns. Come on, Sarge, grin. Let's see that old grin. That's it, grin. He would go on like that, on and on. The only way to get rid of him was to force a miserable smirk. Then he would depart, beaming himself, his mission accomplished. Another corpsman, gaunt and lugubrious, spoke in tones of practised pity. He tried to be cheerful. I found him unbearably depressing. You'll make it, Sarge. You're a fighter, I can tell. Yeah. In a month you'll be back giving those yellow hell. But I had no hell left to give anyone. My head throbbed as the Douglas engines throbbed. I lay in the half-light, fighting the pain where the fragments of shrapnel and bone were, yearning for the drug, my cigarette tracing glowing trajectories in the air, the length of gauze dressing they had given me, wondering how many aboard would in fact making it. Not all I knew. Too many were in critical condition. Head wound went first. We had just crossed the international dateline northeast of Wake when he moaned heavily. Swift shapes darted up, but before they could reach him he sobbed, Mum! and was gone. The blood kept dripping, however, until Fatso cleaned up. He drew the sheet over the dead man's face and folded it over in a straight new margin. I dozed off. The doctor awoke me, peering at me from a range of about three inches. Have a good nap. Sure. How do you feel? I am okay. Do you hurt much? Nope. Do you need something? Nope. I looked around. Chest wound had gone too. There was only a lump under the sheet where his head had been. The next time Fatso appeared, I asked how many other men we had lost. He tried to change the subject, but Mummy heard us, and his voice, a rich baritone, rose through his bandages. He said, Three others, all at this end. Fatso looked distressed, maybe because he could not tell whether Mummy was grinning under all those layers of grease and plaster. Then he brightened and said there would not be any more deaths. Actually, there was another, a man at the far end I had not seen. By the time we entered our glide pattern over Hickam Field, I had almost mastered the geography of our C-54 quarters, with one exception. Down near the tail, to starboard, there was a dark place. Squint as I might, I could not make it out. I assumed that the lights had burned out there, or that it was used to store gear. But as we touched down, two of the corpsmen entered the place, and when the door opened they emerged carrying a litter, another corpse, hidden under its temporary shroud. As the doctor passed, I called to him. He paused. I asked him who else had died. The poor fellow, he sighed. He was so quiet that most of the other patients did not even notice him. Who was he? What was his outfit? He was a private in the 5th Marines. I felt queer. I said, My father was in the 5th. Your father? A long time ago, another war. He said, Do you want this poor fellow's name? No, I breathed. No. He looked at me closely. You do need something. Shove it, Mac. Mummy chuckled. United Flight 005 touches down at Honolulu International Airport at precisely 7.35 Hawaiian time, and as I emerge I am instantly wrapped in sheets of hurrying rain, torrents slanting down diagonally, at intervals coming down in waves like surf. I am unsurprised. It always rains when I arrive in the Pacific. If there is ever a drought they can cable me, I will come out and fix it. Expecting just such a storm, I have fastened all the intricate buttons in the collar of my Burberry. No protection against cloudbursts can match a Marine Corps poncho, but ponchos are unacceptable in the Haleculani, the last of Waikiki's great pre-war hotels, where I am soon dining with Jean and Bob Trumbull. In the early 1950s, Bob and I were foreign correspondents in India, he for the New York Times and I for the Baltimore Sun. I have friends scattered through the Pacific and a fairly good working knowledge of Asia, but Bob's is encyclopedic. On December 7th, 1941, he was city editor of the Honolulu Advertiser and a stringer for the Times. Then the Times hired him full-time, 
and he has been with the paper ever since, mostly around the Pacific Basin. He is the last of the Times World War II correspondents still on the job. Hawaii, he tells me, is, for the first time in its pluralistic history, gripped by racial tension. The problem is the Japanese. Although a minority, they are tightly organised, and as a result they control the local establishment, the politics, industry, unions, even the presidency of the university. The other inhabitants, and particularly the white Americans who have retired here, resent all this. But, Bob adds, Japanese affluence is not confined to Hawaii. That, or something like it, will appear almost everywhere on my journey. In peace, Hirohito's subjects have achieved what eluded them in war, dominance of a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. I tell Bob that the Germans have done the same thing in Europe. The victors of VE and VJ days, we agree, have been outmaneuvered, outsold and outsmarted by the vanquished. My own feeling the next morning is that whoever is in charge here has appalling taste. This is a community of honky-tonks. High-rise condominiums, uncannily like Puerto Rico's, have put the famous beaches northwest of Diamond Head in perpetual shade. Aiea Heights Hospital, where I once lay with thousands of other marine casualties from Iwo and Okinawa, has been raised and replaced by Commander-in-Chief Pacific Headquarters, but the military seems no longer able to correct pernicious practices of civilian tradesmen. On Hotel Street, electric guitars are turned up to incredible sound levels. Aloha shirts are offered at preposterous prices. Muscular transvestites accost you under a marquee which bears the announcement boys will be girls. Prostitution is illegal, but the bars and strip joints on Hotel Street are crowded with hookers, who, if a man pauses within arm's reach, will caress his crotch with a gentle squeeze. Japan's December 7th raid 38 years ago was an outrage, but one feels that the destruction of Honolulu's tenderloin would be less outrageous today. The route followed by the Japanese flyers that long ago Sunday may be traced with some precision. Kolokola Pass, overlooking Schofield Barracks, is a quiet canyon in the steep mountains. One hears no roaring plains there now, only the rustling of leaves in a soft breeze and the murmur of high-tension wires. The barracks below are virtually unaltered since James Jones wrote of them in From Here to Eternity. The quadrangles, the orange buildings, the banyans are redolent of Jones's tale, though they are more sparsely populated. Where 25,000 soldiers were based at Schofield in 1941, there are fewer than 4,000 today. No scars of the raid are visible here. To find them, one must drive to Hickam Field, where strafers point 50 caliber bullets are still embedded in a peach-colored concrete wall. And, of course, to the harbor itself. Historical shrines often become diminished by mundane surroundings. One thinks of St. Peter's in Rome and Boston's Bunker Hill. Still, it is jarring when driving to the port where the United States entered World War II to find a prosaic green and white freeway signs, exactly like those on the American mainland directing drivers to. Following it, and instructions phoned to me at the Halekulani by Commander-in-Chief Pacific, I come to a naval complex of moors and piers, fringed by palms warped by millennia of offshore winds. Elsewhere, commercial launches leave hourly for tours of the harbour, but I am booked on a military very important person junket. Judging by my fellow passengers, almost anyone can be a very important person. There are young boys in t-shirts chewing bubblegum, middle-aged, hennaed, hair-netted women, gross men in riotous aloha shirts, they all seem to be carrying Polaroids or Instamatics. A pretty blonde, whose parents must have been teenagers, if not younger, at the time of the great attack here, appears wearing a petty officer's rating chevrons and calls us to order. Before we leave, she says, we're going to see a short motion picture. She leads us into a Quonset hut and the lights go down. The movie, a national broadcasting company documentary, is suggestive of the March of Time style, and was probably spliced from film clips shortly after the war. The narrator's voice is stentorian. The crashing score is by Richard Rogers. There is a lot of Japanese footage captured after the war. Its chief interest is in what it emits. There is not a single reference to United States bungling. Much is made of the fact that the Japanese missed United States oil reserves, enough for two years, and dockyard repair facilities. At the end, with Rogers' music soaring triumphantly, American warships steam out into the twilight to wreak vengeance on the deceitful enemy. As the lights are turned up, 
one almost feels that the Pearl Harbor raid was an American victory. Judging by their comments as we file out, the other very important persons are impressed. One recalls that the American Navy has always been attentive to its reputation. Especially remembered is the alacrity with which, after the raid, the title of the commanding admiral in Washington was changed to Chief of Naval Operations from Commander-in-Chief, United States. Shepherding us aboard the very important person launch, our blonde sea woman warns us that no pictures may be taken of the port's nuclear submarines, lest they fall into the hands of unfriendly powers. Then we shove off, and she begins her spiel. Little of it is new to me, so I let my attention wander. Ford Island is lush and unpopulated, its runway too short to accommodate today's jets. Floating markers show where each battleship was anchored that December 7th. A wooden rusted iron relic pinpoints the location of the Utah, which went bottom up at 8.12am on the morning of the raid. The chief point of interest is the Arizona Memorial. It is quite lovely, a graceful, dipping concrete arch honouring the 1,102 United States Blue Jackets who lie entombed below. Why was not the ship raised? They tried. Two Navy divers went down and applied acetylene torches to the hull. Accumulated gases within exploded, annihilating both of them. Peering down, you can see the rusting forecastle over whose jutting mast, above the water, the colours are raised and lowered each day. The very important person passengers swarm around, babbling excitedly. This is distasteful, but not peculiarly American. I have seen the same twittering at European war memorials. It is absent in civilian cemeteries, but scenes where men died violently are somehow stimulating. The nuclear submarines, which we cannot photograph, are, in fact, unphotogenic. They are indeed ugly, looking uncannily like sharks. Swinging at anchor in various coves are slate-grey guided missile cruisers and fast frigates, none of them interesting to a necromancer like me. But I jerk upright as we dart by one inlet. Moored, there are the last ships I expected to see in Pearl Harbour, two spanking new destroyers flying the Rising Sun battle ensign of the Empire of Japan. Ashore, I make inquiries and am told that, yes, I saw what I thought I saw, in fact, Japanese naval officers in dress whites are frequent guests at Pearl's officers' mess. And, my informant adds, they are very polite. Naturally, they always were. Except, of course, for that little interval there between 1941 and 1945. At 3 a.m. in my comfortable Halekulani bed, my eyes pop open. The lean, hard, dreamland sergeant in me has been leering sardonically, recalling the loud-mouthed tourists, Hotel Street smut, the Navy's cover-up movie, and the welcome mat for Hirohito's seafarers. That will be the sergeant's attitude every night, and he will come every night during the early stages of my trip. If I rarely mention him, it is because his performance has become as unvaried as a cult rite. He gloats and glares and smirks cynically. I have begun to realise that it will take a great deal, a firestorm of passion, to exercise him. In Honolulu, the old man has no answer for the sergeant, his experiences here have shaken him. Somehow Hawaii hasn't stirred memories of the blows inflicted on that distant day of infamy. And I think I know why. The answer, I believe, is that there was virtually no opposition to the Japanese, and therefore no fight. Like Fort Sumter, like Sarajevo, the disaster at Pearl is best remembered as a curtain raiser, largely irrelevant to the drama which followed. We were prepared to visit retribution on the enemy tenfold, but we did not identify with the victims. Few had fought back, and as professionals they should have been ready to fight. Now we, the amateurs, had to do the job. And though we mourned them, the very brevity of the December 7th attack meant that there had not been time to hang breathless on their fate. The Philippines, however, was another story. My arrival at Manila International Airport in the small hours of a Thursday morning is hilarious. Carlos Romulo, a friend of mine and a legend to the Filipinos, has sent word from the United Nations that he wants his countrymen to treat me with our traditional hospitality. Traditional hospitality, to one of the Spanish patricians who rule the Philippines, stops just short of offering a guest his place in the marriage bed. One moment I am standing before an officious little airport bureaucrat, arguing with him over the validity of a health form. In the next moment, this unfortunate clerk is whisked away, possibly to penal servitude, and I am being greeted by a delegation of ten high officials, headed by a cabinet minister. 
As I slide into an air-conditioned limousine, a siren commences to wind in a police cruiser directly in front of us, and we are off, following it to the Manila Hotel, where General Douglas MacArthur lived before Pearl Harbor. My schedule, I am told, has been prepared. President Marcos will receive me. His first lady, the beautiful Imelda Romualdez Marcos, also known as the Iron Butterfly, will also grant me an audience, and on the last evening of my visit, the Romulo family will hold a reception in my honour. This sort of thing hasn't happened to me since the Turkish general staff mistook me for an envoy from President Eisenhower. My feelings are mixed. Official sanction opens many doors, but it closes others. The Philippines have been under martial law for seven years. Marcos is a dictator. Anxiety over his image abroad has, I am sure, been one of his motives in staging this fantastic welcome for me. Luckily, I haven't arrived unprepared. I have the names of the underground leaders who oppose him, and I know how to reach them. My mission, however, is neither to flatter nor to expose the present regime. I am digging into the past, and the past in the Philippines is littered with booby traps. Many members of Manila's present establishment bear names of men who collaborated with the Japanese during the war. One must be careful with them. In addition, as Teddy White has observed, the journalist who becomes a celebrity has special problems. Those whom he interviews know that their replies to him may be quoted by historians, so they become bland at best, or, at worst, self-serving. In Manila, a prosperous American may quickly acquire the feeling of having become an honorary member of a very small upper class, all of whom recognize one another anywhere. I am unastonished to encounter Imelda Marcos in a public building. We chatter idly about her coronation as Miss Manila. There had been no Miss Manila until then, but her family's powerful friends created the title when she was not chosen Miss Philippines, and we hardly notice her guard of honour, 22 uniformed Filipinos with fixed bayonets standing at present arms. In Tsarist Russia, noblemen called the masses the Dark People. Here they are more like an endless bolt of grey cloth, every thread exactly like the others. It would be so I easy to retreat into one of the patricians' mansions, but the rules of the writer's trade forbid that. So I cancel appointments and instead ride on jeepneys and explore the city. Jeepneys are minibuses, jeeps roofed with gaudy awnings and decorated on their bonnets with silvery Catholic icons. Recognising my nationality, passengers call me Joe, and some ask for money, the shiny barrier between all Americans and the world's have-nots. Its presence is felt most keenly when one wanders into the Tondo, Manila's equivalent of San Juan's Perla, a vast slum of huts and cardboard cartons, where one is told strangers may be slain by poison dart guns. I emerge unharmed but glad to be out of it. I would not venture into the Tondo after dark. Next morning I rise before dawn. My room overlooks Manila Bay, and in the first olive moments of day I sense a hulk of land to my right. Then the land becomes visible, a peninsula floating in a smoke-coloured vapour, and the jungly land rises harshly to two five-thousand-foot mountains, whose torn, ragged edges, even in that opaque haze, betray their volcanic origin. I am looking at Bataan. Beginning at 2 a.m. on Monday, December 22, 1941, three shopping days before Christmas, some 43,000 troops of Lieutenant General Masaharu Homer's 14th Army began wading ashore at Lingayan Gulf, 120 miles north of Manila. They had been expected for two weeks. Guam had fallen to the Japanese in a few hours, and although the United States Marine garrison still held Wake Island, after a 45-minute battle in which a handful of Marines had routed a Nipponese invasion fleet, Wake was also doomed. But everyone knew that the real struggle would come in the Philippines. Allied troops were commanded by a 60-year-old general who had retired from the United States Army in 1937 and had been recalled to active service by President Roosevelt the same day Roosevelt shut off Tokyo's oil spigots. Douglas MacArthur's great years lay ahead, but no one could have known that in the tumultuous days which followed Pearl Harbor. Despite nine hours' warning from Pearl, the General's Air Force was destroyed on the ground at Clark Field. Moreover, he had failed to move his rice stocks to defensible positions, and now, with Homer ashore, most of MacArthur's green, undisciplined Filipino troops broke and ran for the hills. 
over 10,000 Japanese attack troops, spreading like a vast stain over northern Luzon, merged into three columns and came thundering down Route 3, the old cobblestoned military highway that led to Manila. Then MacArthur recovered. The Japanese expected him to defend the capital. Instead, he abandoned it and executed a series of dazzling moves which stunned and bewildered Homer. Soldiers call a retreat a retrograde manoeuvre. MacArthur was carrying out a double retrograde manoeuvre, extricating both the surviving troops which were still fighting Homer and the smaller force defending southern Luzon, uniting them and thereby foiling the enemy's attempt to split his command. Leapfrogging his divisions backward, holding positions until the last possible moment, and then twitching down barriers for their pursuers to stumble over, he withdrew his forces across the twin-spanned Columpit Bridge, 20 miles northwest of Manila, just south of the San Fernando Rail Junction. Then, with his forces intact, he ordered the bridge blown. Looking like a tired hawk, the phrase is Romulo's. MacArthur had succeeded in forming an army of 65,000 Filipinos and 15,000 Americans within the sheer green ridges and deep valleys of Bataan Peninsula. On January 6, 1942, they sowed mines, dug trenches and wired themselves in, awaiting the enemy's attack on their line. It came and they held and held and held. To the amazement of the world, which had seen resistance to Dai Nippon crumble everywhere else. The siege of Singapore had lasted just seven days when the British general surrendered 85,000 Empire troops to 30,000 Japanese. MacArthur's men, ridden by malaria, beriberi, smallpox, dysentery, hookworm, dengue fever and pellagra, repulsed Homer's January offensive and, when he attempted two amphibious landings behind their lines, flung the invaders into the sea. Again and again, the American regulars and their Filipino allies barred the enemy from penetrating deeper than the midriff of the peninsula. They thought they could retake Manila, which, at the time, seemed a distinct possibility. Homar was a bumbling commander, and his troops, also afflicted by diseases, were second-rate. Japan's elite divisions were attacking the Malay barrier, south of Singapore. All MacArthur's men needed was help from the United States, and therein lies a tragic tale. They had every reason to believe that convoys were on the way. Roosevelt cabled Manuel Quezon, president of the Philippine Commonwealth, then on Corregidor. I can assure you that every vessel available is bearing the strength that will eventually crush the enemy. I give to the people of the Philippines my solemn pledge that their freedom will be retained. The entire resources in men and materials of the United States stand behind that pledge. General George C. Marshall, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Army Chief of Staff, radioed MacArthur. A stream of four-engine bombers, previously delayed by foul weather, is en route. Another stream of similar bombers started today from Hawaii, staging at New Island Fields. Two groups of powerful medium bombers of long range and heavy bomb load capacity leave this week. Pursuit planes are coming on every ship we can use. Our strength is to be concentrated, and it should exert a decisive effect on Japanese shipping and force a withdrawal northward. All this was untrue. Not a plane, not a warship, not a single United States reinforcement reached Bataan or Corregidor. The only possible explanation for arousing false expectations on the peninsula was that Washington was trying to buy time for other, more defensible outposts. As the truth sank in, the men facing Homer became embittered, Unaware that MacArthur had to remain on the island of Corregidor, the Rock, because its communications centre provided his only contact with Washington, they scornfully called the general Dugout Doug. That was cruel and unjust. But if ever men were entitled to a scapegoat, they were. Quite apart from the Japanese, they faced Bataan's almost unbelievable jungle. Cliffs are unscalable. Rivers are treacherous. Behind huge nara, mahogany, trees, eucalyptus trees, ipils and tortured banyans, almost impenetrable screens are formed by tropical vines, creepers and bamboo. Beneath these lie sharp coral outcroppings, fibrous undergrowth and a long grass inhabited by pythons. In the early months of the year, when the battle was fought, rain poured down almost steadily. The water was contaminated. MacArthur's men ate roots, leaves, papayas, monkey meat, wild chickens and wild pigs. They sang to the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Dugout Doug MacArthur lies a shaking on the rock, safe from all the bombers and from any sudden shock. And one soldier wrote, 
We're the battling fools of Bataan. No mama, no papa, no Uncle Sam. No aunts, no uncles, no nephews, no nieces. No rifles, no planes or artillery pieces. And nobody gives a damn. Yet they fought on with a devotion which would puzzle the generation of the 1980s. More surprising, in many instances, it would have baffled the men they themselves were before Pearl Harbor. Among MacArthur's ardent infantrymen were cooks, mechanics, pilots whose planes had been shot down, seamen whose ships had been sunk, and some civilian volunteers. One civilian was a saddle-shoed American youth, a typical Joe College of that era who had been in the Philippines researching an anthropology paper. A few months earlier, he had been an isolationist whose only musical interest was swing. He had used an accordion to render tunes like Deep Purple and Moonlight Cocktail. Captured and sentenced to be shot, he made a last request. He wanted to die holding his accordion. This was granted, and he went to the wall playing God Bless America. It was that kind of time. Only in early spring, when Homa was strengthened by 22,000 fresh troops, howitzers and fleets of Mitsubishis and Zeros, did the Filipinos and Americans on Bataan Peninsula surrender. Then Corregidor, the bone in the throat of Manila Bay, held out for another exhausting month. Even so, Marines and Blue Jackets entrenched on the island's beaches terminated half the Nipponese attack force. And it was not until June 6 that formal resistance ended, when a Japanese hauled down the last American flag and ground it under his heel as a band played Kimigayo, his national anthem. Nevertheless, the capitulation was the largest in United States history. For those who had survived to surrender on Bataan, the worst lay ahead. The ten-day, 75-mile notorious death march to prisoner of war cages in northern Luzon. Japanese guards began shooting prisoners who collapsed in the sun and suffocating dust beneath the pitiless sky. Next, they withheld water from men dying of thirst. Beatings followed, and beheadings and torture. No one knows how many Allied soldiers perished during this Gethsemane, but most estimates run between seven and 10,000. After the war, the Filipinos decided to pay tribute to these martyrs with signposts marking each kilometre on Route 3, which was paved and rechristened MacArthur Highway. Each sign bore a silhouette of three stumbling Allied infantrymen trying to help one another, and travellers were told how far the death marchers had struggled at that point. It is sad to note that over half the signs have vanished, lost through neglect or taken by sightseers. This is that kind of time. But other memorials are intact, though not always where one might expect to find them. The airstrip where MacArthur lost most of his B-17 Air Force is merely another B-52 runway. The vital Columpet Bridge is identifiable only by an odd reference point, a soft drink bottling factory surrounded by weeds. There are no plaques or shafts in the rainforests where the beleaguered Filipinos and Americans counterattacked Homer's troops, driving them back and back. However, in the village, or barrio, of Lamao, which lies on the bayside of the peninsula, a stone identifies the spot where Major General Edward P. King, Jr., the Bataan commander, capitulated on April 9, 1942, and in Marivelli's on the southern tip, an American rifle is cemented into a block with a GI helmet welded to the butt of the gun. If you charter a helicopter, monuments may be found on the slopes of the peninsula towering heights, Mount Marivelles and Mount Natib. One inscription reads, Our mission is to remember. Another, in Tagalog, the native tongue, marks the Damabana Nangkagatingan, the altar of valor. A relief map with coloured red and blue lights shows successive Japanese and Allied positions on the peninsula. It is interesting to note that the altar is the work of Ferdinand E. Marcos, who, as a junior officer here, he was a third lieutenant, was awarded two distinguished service crosses, two silver stars, and two purple hearts, making him the war's most decorated Filipino. If Mussolini made trains run on time, it can at least be said that Marcos lets the dead lie in style. There is just one happily discordant note. Chiseled letters bear the democratic message, to live in freedom's light is the right of mankind. Above it stands a crucifix formed of two parallel uprights and two horizontal bars. It can only be described as a double cross. The easiest way to see Bataan, if you can afford it, is by helicopter. Next easiest is by rented launch, which can take you from Manila to Marivelles, where tadpole-shaped Corregidor is visible, 
three miles from the peninsula in less than two hours. But if you really want to steep yourself in Bataan's synoptic past, you must go by land. Since there is no rail service and buses are unreliable, this means in a car, preferably with four-wheel drive, because ruts and potholes pit MacArthur Highway. Lack of maintenance characterises the Pacific's adoption of Occidental modes almost everywhere. It may even be found in the tiny Central Pacific Republic of Nauru, whose precious phosphate deposits are said to give its 6,000 people a per capita income of over $40,000 a year. If a car breaks down on Nauru, it is ditched and replaced with another. There are no limousines on Bataan and very few cars. The typical vehicle is a wagon drawn by a horse or a bullock. To park and enter a barrio is to move back to the Stone Age. Until MacArthur retreated into the peninsula, the inhabitants lived as their ancestors had, content in their insularity. After the war, most of them returned to it. There are a few signs of the 20th century there, an Exxon refinery at Lamau and a few tiny huts with rusting tin roofs where Hollywood films are shown. Even so, none of the natives seems to grasp what a refinery is, and the favourite recreation is watching cockfights. The government in Manila has outlawed them, but the peasants here don't know it. Inland, they haven't even heard of Manila, or, for that matter, of Bataan. It is their universe. They need no name for it. Except for the inhabitants of New Guinea and the Northern Solomons, I know of no people more isolated from the outside world than the Batanese. Here, on mountainous slopes within sight of the Philippines' capital, warriors hunt game with bows and arrows. Lithe Filipinas, striding past rice paddies with hand-carved wooden pitchforks balanced on their lovely heads, pass backdrops which might be taken from a Tarzan movie, waterfalls cascading in misty rainbows, orchids growing from canyon walls, and from time to time typhoons lashing the palm-fringed beaches. Driving from the site of the Columpit Bridge to Marivelis, you leave your car from time to time for excursions beyond the bayside barrios. The villages are all pretty much alike. There is no electricity. Generators must be brought in for the rare movies, and virtually no line of communications to the world outside. Fishermen live in little straw shacks atop stilts. Their boats are outriggers. Inland, bullocks tug hand-hewn implements through rice paddies. The green sprouts are reaped by stooping women wading in the ankle-deep water. Their husbands climb palm trees to toss down coconuts, whose dried meat, copra, is their one export. The largest export, indeed, of the entire Philippines. An acrid scent bites the air. Following it, you come upon a sugarcane field being burned off. Somehow the jungle seems friendlier to those who inhabit it. Men sing as they hammer away with rough mauls. Women gossip while sitting in a circle, peeling leaves from cabbage plants. Children hoot cheerfully as they play tag between lumbering water buffalo in shallow, muddy streams crowded on their banks with huge green shrubs, whose wide leaves dip gracefully in all directions. Twice, in the memory of their patriarchs, outsiders have arrived uninvited to use this as a slain ground, in the 1942 struggle and again when the victorious Americans returned three years later. No one knows how many peasants were slain by random shots and artillery bursts, but certainly more of them died than American civilians at home, who had a stake in the war yet were out of danger. And what? the sergeant in me asks. Did we give them in return? Well, there was venereal disease, hitherto unknown here, and insensate hatred between aliens and efficient ways to destroy those you hated. Most cruelly, they were left with an uneasy feeling that these monstrous strangers had, for all their brutality, found clever ways of making life more tolerable and interesting. It was cruel because that way of life can never coexist with theirs. One recalls a prescient passage in the journal of Captain James Cook, the first European to discover the South Seas, in 1769. I cannot avoid expressing it as my real opinion that it would have been far better for these poor people never to have known our superiority in the accommodations and arts that make life comfortable than after once knowing it to be again left and abandoned in their original incapacity of improvement. Indeed, they cannot be restored to that happy mediocrity in which they lived before we discovered them if the intercourse between us should be discontinued. I am aboard a helicopter, descending through a blue mist between Corregidor's sheer cliffs toward the old Fort Drum parade ground. From this height, the island seems larger than expected, about the size of Manhattan, and attractive. 
Of course, that was not always true. Why, George? Jean MacArthur said to George Kenny, her husband's air commander, when she returned to Manila Bay at the end of the war. What have you done to Corregidor? I could hardly recognize it when we passed it. It looks as though you had lowered it at least forty feet. Certainly, it had been lowered some. Between Japanese artillery in the first months of the war and Kenny's B-24s dumping 4,000 tons of bombs on it later, the rock had been changed beyond belief, denuded, among other things, of all vegetation. Today, neither Jean nor Kenny would recognise the rock. Two years after the war, American troops reforested it, populated it with monkeys and small deer, and presented it to the Philippines as a national park. Only park police and caretakers live there now, though there is a small guesthouse on a bluff overlooking the North Dock for tourists who want to remain overnight. Like the picnics at Verdun in the 1920s, turning the rock into a recreational spot may be an attempt to exercise the desperate past. If so, it fails, for despite the view from the helicopter, once you step upon the parade ground you feel yourself caught by a slipped cog of time, transported back in a 37-year time warp. Especially is this true in Malinta Tunnel. The tunnel is a short ride from the parade ground in a park bus, or, if you have taken the two-hour ferry from Manila, a short winding walk from the North Dock. Twin sets of rails lead into Malinta, but they are useless now. A recent typhoon loosened an avalanche on the craggy hill overhead, which slid down the 70-foot beetling outcropping over the east entrance, partly blocking it and reducing the carved legend there to NNEL. Inside the 826-foot shaft are 24 30-foot laterals, short passages branching off the main corridor. There is no electricity, and you have to step carefully to avoid stumbling over old crates of 8-inch gun ammunition. But with a flashlight you can read signs identifying which laterals were used for casualties, for religious services, for messing, for nurses' quarters, a wooden barrier across the moor here. The memory of their virginity is honoured by Filipinos, who still think maidenhood important and lateral number three for MacArthur's headquarters. In the dim light and dank, musty air, one feels like an intruder. You are surrounded by some 11,000 ghosts, the number of men Jonathan Wainwright surrendered to the Japanese on May 8, 1942. A sense of individual loneliness survives them. Here they had wept, moaned, sworn, slept fitfully, dreamed, quivered with fear, bled and died. In these laterals, each had endured his or her special kind of illness, the women terrified of dishonour, Filipino Catholics, four of every five, of dying without last rites, Romulo in anguish for his family, now in Japanese hands, Quezon coughing away his tubercular life, MacArthur pacing in his cramped quarters and threatening to disobey Washington's repeated order that he abandon his command and try to break out to Australia, saying, as he paced, that he would rather resign his commission, cross to Bataan, and enlist there as a private. The general's prose was dramatic, as always, but Corregidor's last stand was nothing if not melodramatic. After Corregidor had fallen, he said of it, Intrinsically it is but a barren, war-worn rock, hallowed as so many places are, by death and disaster. Yet it symbolises within itself that priceless, deathless thing, the honour of a nation. Until we claim again the ghastly remnants of its last gaunt garrison, we can but stand humble supplicants before Almighty God. There lies our holy grail. American sophisticates mocked such empurpled rhetoric, but there was no laughter in the Philippines. To Filipinos the rock is still sacred ground. Leaving Malinta one discovers, around a corner to the left, a thirty-foot stone shaft with a simple plaque identifying this as the spot where Wainwright displayed the white flag. A mounted diagram shows who was where during the siege. On top side, Corregidor's highest point, a marble dome, is suspended above a white memorial. Once a year the sun shines through the hole in the dome, turning white to gold. Nearby an eternal flame flickers, and torn pieces of shells and strips from wrecked aircraft have been welded into a cathedral spire. Walls alongside bear the names of the great Pacific battles. The Japanese remember Corregidor too. Nipponese Christians have erected a cross with the inscription, in Japanese and English, May the bodies of the dead soldiers of the Philippines, the United States and Japan rest in peace. War monuments have never stirred me. They are like the reconstructed buildings at Colonial Williamsburg, or elaborate reproductions of great paintings, 
no matter how deft the execution, they are essentially counterfeit. In addition, they are usually beautiful and in good taste, whereas combat is neither. Before the war, I thought that Hemingway, by stripping battle narratives of their ripe prose, was describing the real thing. Afterward, I realised that he had simply replaced traditional overstatement with romantic understatement. War is never understated. Combat as I saw it was exorbitant, outrageous, excruciating, and above all, tasteless, perhaps because the number of fighting men who had read Hemingway or Remark was a fraction of those who had seen B-movies about bloodshed. If a platoon leader had watched Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., Enrol Flynn, Victor McLaglen, John Wayne or Gary Cooper leap recklessly about, he was likely to follow his role model. In crises, most people are imitative. Soldiers received Dear John letters copied from those quoted in the press. The minority who avoided Hollywood paradigms were, like me, people who had watched fewer B-movies than we had read books. That does not mean that we were better soldiers and citizens. We certainly were not braver. I do think that our optics were clearer, however, that what we saw was closer to the truth, because we were not looking through MGM or RKO prisms. Thus, my most moving moments on Corregidor are neither in the tunnel nor before the shrines. They are more mundane, coming amid the island's surface relics, where men like me fought against impossible odds to defend the yawning AA batteries and the huge 360-degree 12-inch coastal batteries with their 17-mile range, which still leer across Manila Bay. Particularly evocative are the gaunt stone dun-coloured skeletons of the ruined Fort Mills barracks, now overgrown with lichen and dalacorac vines. Here, rusted but still recognisable, is the homely debris of military housekeeping, the canteens and mess gear, the hastily discarded point thirty and point fifty calibre shells, the old-fashioned straight razors and steel combs and mops used in preparing for formal inspections in the last days of peace. And as I poke and prod among these souvenirs of anguish, my mind drifts back to the tunnel's rail track. It troubles me, something there. I once saw rails like that before. Of course, it had been that single, narrow-gauge set of tracks at the Asakawa. I had skulked along its embankment on my way to. Abruptly, the poker of memory stirs the ashes of recollection and uncovers a forgotten ember, still smouldering down there, still hot, still glowing, still red as red. The name of the little rise was a meek ridge. The Japanese held it. We needed it. But enemy guns on adjacent hills kept driving us off. The last time there had been any large-scale action here, an attacking company had been reduced to one officer and 19 men. Now Bob Fowler, Fox Company's commanding officer, was being told to take the crest late that afternoon. I carried the message to him in the shadow of that railroad embankment. His SCR-536, his hand talkie, was not working. They never did when you needed them. And his SCR-300, his backpack radio, had also broken down, cutting his only wireless tie with battalion. So I had been sent. Had I known I was carrying a sheaf of death warrants, I would have ducked into the company command post, left Fowler's order with any of his several lieutenants or senior non-coms, and made myself scarce. Runners like me were transients, subject to hijacking by any commander who needed an extra hand. Sure enough, moments after I rambled in, smeared with mire from the embankment, the corporal who was supposed to lead the right-hand squad took a bullet in the shoulder. Fowler, recognising me, told me to replace the corporal. I was, I realised, in deep peril. One squad, twelve men, would be looking out for each other. And who was going to look out for their strange new three-striped leader? Since Fowler himself was later dead, I can't be bitter. But God knows I felt ill-used before that night was over. As it happened, we were not part of the attack. There was a little draw just west of the ridge, pitted with shell holes. Fowler wanted it cleared out. Japanese hidden there could turn his flank. It was uninhabited, but lethal all the same, for the enemy was encircling the entire ridge with a tremendous concentration of artillery. As my father had found, the worst shells are those that burst overhead. That was what the Japanese were sending over. I remember hearing the chargers braying on the left as the men went up the slope, the southerners among them yip-yipping their rebel yells, while I carefully probed the length of the draw, my point forty-five safety off, my finger ready to squeeze at the slightest sound or movement. 
My exaggerated, combat-wise, high-knee gait was like the strides of a man wearing new bifocals and unsure of how far away the ground might be. I was seasoned now, scared but in control provided I was not pushed too hard. I did not anticipate trouble once I saw the drawer was empty. No shells were arriving there just then. Actually, I was about to be shoved and decked. I was returning to the squad on the double when I tripped on a strand of communications wire and fell headlong into a large muddy crater left by an earlier bombardment. At that instant, a Japanese shell shimmied in and exploded about fifteen feet above the drawer. My fall saved me. The others were all dead instantly, though I had no way of knowing that at the time. Fowler's attack was clearly failing. The shouts were fading, dying down. I had no intention of moving till night fell. When it did, I crawled around to find whether there were any of my people still alive. There weren't. No one moaned. Everywhere I groped I felt only gobs of blood, shards of shattered bones, ropey intestines and slimy brains. A flare burst overhead. I saw none of the squad had made it. There was not even the form of a human body. I slid back into the crater and lay there for a while in a numb stupor, trying to wipe the offal from my hands. Suddenly I half turned into the muck, a victim of survivor's guilt, pounding and pounding and pounding my fist, sobbing. It is not fair, it is not fair, they are dead. Why can't I be dead? It is not fair. Twelve men had been entrusted to me and I had lost them. Still weeping, I passed out. There are no clocks on battlefields. Time is seamless there. I have not the faintest idea how long I was out. As I regained consciousness in the darkness, a fly was drawing Z's around my head. There was no other sound, only an enormous stillness without echo. Apparently rain had fallen. I was drenched, and there were new puddles around me. I felt paralysed. It was so bleak in that hole, so lonely and so forever. I wondered vaguely if this was when it would end, whether I would pull up tonight's darkness like a quilt and be dead and at peace evermore. Again I passed out, and as I came to I felt the skin prickling on the backs of my hands and the nape of my neck. A fresh fear was creeping across my mind, quietly, stealthily, imperceptibly. I sat up, my muscles rippling with suppressed panic, stared across the shell hole, now dimly lit by moonlight and a descending flare, and saw that I had company, a creature somehow familiar who flickered in and out of sight, an adumbration on the fringes of my awareness. Hallucinations, as Robert Graves and Siegfried Sassoon recalled in their memoirs of World War I trench warfare, are common in war. If you lie in a dark hole, listening to the sound of your own breathing, dead objects may rise and live, bald rocks may be transformed into men's pates, pinnacled stones may become witches' fingers. One of the commonest delusions is to see in the distance a buddy you know is dead, one you actually saw die, now very much alive. He is smiling at you. You run over and of course he is not there. Then there are appearances of phantom Japanese, I knew a major who dropped his pants in the bush on Guadalcanal and squatted to defecate. A shot rang out. Another marine had spotted a Japanese sniper in a coconut tree overhead. The dead sniper dropped thirty feet and plopped right in front of the major. Starting right then, he developed an extraordinary case of constipation. Every time he tried to empty his bowels, he saw Japanese above him. Three weeks later, he was flown to Noumea for surgery, but meanwhile his value in combat had been wiped. Similarly, a man in our 81mm mortar platoon awoke in his foxhole one night and saw himself ringed by Japanese with fixed bayonets. He grabbed his carbine, tried to turn off the safety, and hit the magazine release instead. The magazine fell out. He had a weapon but no ammunition in it. He grabbed the barrel by the stacking swivel, turning the butt into a club, and swatted away in all directions, crying for help. He was lucky he was not eliminated by the marines around him, they wrestled him to the ground and convinced him he was out of danger, but to the end of his life, three weeks later, he stubbornly insisted that those Japanese had been real. And, of course, to him they were. So it was with me that terrible night. Another flare revealed that my visitor was feminine. That was startling. What was a woman doing up here? My heart welling with pity, I thought she must be a native, one of the innocent civilian bystanders who were dying in the struggle for the island. Then the shock of recognition hit me. She was not harmless. She was evil. I was in the presence of the whore of death. Since terminating my first Japanese soldier, I had been one of her many pimps, 
leading Japanese after Japanese into her brothel. Now she wanted me as her next trick. Her identity might have puzzled others. She lacked the grace and movements of a geisha. She was not even oriental, nor was she the stereotypical prostitute of the Occident. She wore no black net stockings, no flimsy negligee. She knew her mark too well for that. Corrupted innocence, not candid wickedness, was the right bait for an inhibited New Englander. She was, instead, dressed like the girls I remembered at Smith and Mount Holyoke. A cashmere twin sweater set, a Peter Pan collar, a string of pearls, a plaid skirt, bobby socks and loafers. Her dirty blonde hair fell in a shoulder-length pageboy coiffure, and when she turned her head abruptly to glance at her watch, she tossed her tresses like a young goddess. Her legs were crossed, her skirt demurely below her knees. Judging by her silhouette in the dim moonlight, her figure was superb, her breasts high and firm beneath the cashmere, her legs magnificent. Glowing phosphorescence, a kind of inner light, revealed the lure of her sexuality, and flashes of translucence allowed me to see through her clothes intermittently. But she was not from the Seven Sisters. The moonlight and a closer flare betrayed her indeed, to a healthy imagination she was the most improbable of sex objects. She exhaled a foul stench, but it was her eyes, eyes as old as tombs, which were most phenomenal. None of this sounds inviting, let alone seductive. But the shell which had wiped out my squad had barely missed me. So close a call with death is often followed by eroticism. It is characteristic of some creatures that they are often very productive before their death, and in some cases appear to die in a frenzy of reproductive activity. Desire is the sequel to danger. That is the reason for the recruitment, in most of history's great armies, of camp followers, at a wink from the soiled whore of death I became semi-hard. She knew that and stretched herself, accentuating her bust and her slender waist and increasing my tumescence. I simultaneously loathed and craved her. She was an enchantress in an old tale whom men have loved to their destruction. She would not sigh or swoon or feign affection. Love was the last thing she had to offer. Her coarse, blurred, sepulchral voice, just audible, rasped obscenities and spoke of the bargain she proposed to strike in the language she had used for a thousand years of warfare. The key words were lust and blood and death. She had been in business a long time. Her face was eroded by a millennium of whoring. The traffic around her lunging crotch had always been heavy, but the number of customers in this century had dwarfed all those before. Abruptly, she hoisted her skirt to her hips and spread her legs. My pulse was hammering, my sexual craving almost overwhelming. That was my moment of maximum temptation. I have never been more ready. Then, from her sultry muttering, I learned her fee. I could not mount her here. She gestured toward the Japanese lines. I shrank back, shaking my head and whispering, No, no, I won't, no, no. Number just then, a random shell rustled over and landed a few yards away. In the flash, she disappeared. I unfastened my dungarees and touched myself. I came in less than five seconds. I was that close. After crawling out of the hole, I was, for the only time in combat, quite lost. It was not until the sky was lightening that I saw the hunchback of the ridge against the eastern sky, and taking bearings from it crept slowly toward Fox Company's wire. My situation was still extremely perilous. Fowler had dug in for the inevitable counter-attack. I was about five yards from safety when a deep voice with a Bronx accent challenged me, ordering me to halt. I gave the password. The voice said gently, Come on in, Mac. I reported to Fowler, omitting my vision. He grieved for his lost squad and asked anxiously, Were you hurt? I shook my head and said, Not a scratch. I believed it. I leave Corregidor for Manila aboard a steamship, a rusting, lumbering vessel. As we pull away from the rock's north dock, the captain tugs the whistle cord, and I am distracted by its lonely shriek, sadder than the wails of steam locomotives I remember from my boyhood. Seen from the second deck, where I perch in a plastic chair outside a plastic lounge, the water is calm and blue. Throughout the two-hour voyage the air is humid, and as we approach the dock just off Roxas Highway, the capital is partly obscured by smog. I observe all this and write it down because that is my trade, but my mind is elsewhere. I am thinking of Christmas Eve, 1941, when MacArthur and his party abandoned Manila to Homer 
and sailed to the rock on the small Interisland steamer Don Esteban. They were on Corregidor thirteen weeks. Once he grasped the staggering fact that he would receive no reinforcements, the general knew the Japanese would take the island. He intended to die there and expected his wife and his four-year-old son to die with him. After he had balked at Washington's order that he leave, he was vulnerable to a court-martial. Still, he held back. Then his staff, reviewing the cables from the War Department, persuaded him that a great army awaited him in Australia, ready to return under his leadership and reconquer the Philippines. His breakout through 3,000 miles of enemy waters, first by PT boat and then aboard a decrepit plane, is one of the greatest escape stories in the history of war. But when he reached the little Australian town of Kuringa, he was stunned to learn that the country was virtually defenceless. He had fewer troops down under than the garrison he had left on Bataan and Corregidor. Australia's divisions were in Egypt, fighting Rommel. God have mercy on us, MacArthur said hollowly when he was told. Turning away, he clenched his teeth until his jaw was white. It was, he later wrote, his greatest shock and surprise of the whole war. But the diggers took heart when he appeared in Melbourne. They knew how exasperating he could be. Every civilian who had dealt with him was aware of his vanity, his megalomania and his paranoia. But his military genius was already a legend, and genius was required by the Allies at this point in the Pacific War, for Australia faced imminent invasion by the triumphant armies of the Empire of Japan. In the spring of 1942, when Corregidor fell and I joined the Marines, a glance at a global map would have convinced an impartial observer were there any left that our side was losing the war. Indeed, one could have argued persuasively that the Allies had already lost it. Hitler was master of Europe. He ruled an empire larger than the United States, with conquests stretching from the Arctic waters in the north to the Libyan desert in the south, from the English Channel in the west to within a day's march of the Caspian Sea in the east. It seemed that nothing could stop Erwin Rommel from seizing Cairo and the Suez Canal, Certainly the Americans could not. Thus far they had been an ineffectual ally. They had no troops in the field. They could not ever serve, in their president's phrase, as a valuable arsenal of democracy. United States merchantmen were being torpedoed nightly in the Atlantic, 1,160 that year, often within view of their Atlantic seaboard. Too few were reaching Murmansk or English ports with tanks or munitions to tip the scales. An imminent link-up between German and Japanese armies, probably in India, appeared to be inevitable. American eyes were riveted on Europe. Asia and Oceania, on the other hand, mystified them. They mistook Singapore for Shanghai and thought it was a Chinese city. Most of them were unaware that Hawaii is closer to Japan than to the Philippines. Later, men on Iwo Jima would get V-mail from relatives who thought they were fighting in the South Pacific although Iwo, like Lower California, is over 1,700 miles north of the equator. To this day, few GIs and Marines have the remotest idea of where they fought. Even Australians, whose very survival was threatened by Hirohito's legions, are baffled by the geography of the Pacific. Allied commanders had some knowledge of it, however, and they were almost overwhelmed by the task confronting them. They estimated that recapturing lands lost to the foe would take at least ten years. The rising sun was blinding. The Japanese Empire dwarfed Hitler's. It stretched 5,000 miles in every direction and included Formosa, the Philippines, Indochina, Thailand and Burma, Malaya, Sumatra, Borneo, Java and the Celebes, the Kuril Islands, the Bonins, Ryukyus, Marianas, Carolines, Palaus, Marshalls and Gilberts, northern New Guinea, two Alaskan islands, most of inhabited China, and almost all of the Solomons. In less than six months, the Nipponese had taken a gigantic leap toward a Pax Japonica, conquering lands which had resisted penetration by the Western powers for over a century. Like the tsunamis, those undersea tidal waves which break with unpredictable force upon distant shores, the Nipponese Blitz had swept up a million square miles, almost a seventh of the globe, an area three times as large as the United States and Europe combined. These were golden days for the conquering soldiers of Dai Nippon. A neutral onlooker writes that they found lush realms with snow-white beaches, frond huts, coconut palms and dark-skinned people who wore sarongs, 
grass skirts and loincloths called laplaps. The Japanese went fishing in the lagoons or streams, using camouflage nets as seines. They played cards and swam. They climbed palm trees to gather coconuts and exchanged cigarettes and canned goods for fresh fruit, bananas, papayas and mangoes. Until the shipping lanes were cut off, vessels from Japan brought news, letters, movies, dancers, singers and packages filled with snacks and other amenities. Particularly welcome were the so-called comfort women, prostitutes who volunteered for service in the battle zones to help ease the tensions and improve the morale among the troops. To the Japanese, Southeast Asia was a treasure house, the land of everlasting summer. Their leaders were dazzled. They had never anticipated such successes. At the time of Pearl Harbor, they had expected to lose a quarter of their naval strength in their first offensives. Instead, they had won their new imperial realm at a cost of 25,000 tons of shipping, less than that of the Arizona alone. The largest Nipponese warship to go down had been a destroyer. In Tokyo, Hirohito, who had acquired 150 million new subjects, told his Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal, The fruits of war are tumbling into our mouth almost too quickly. His elated generals and admirals had no such misgivings. They knew they had broken the myth of white supremacy. They had surpassed the Allies on every level. Their strategy was superior, the tactics more skillful, their navy and air force larger and more efficient, their infantry better prepared and more experienced. In amphibious operations, as Gavin M. Long has pointed out, their landings of whole armies on surf beaches were of a magnitude only dreamt of in the West. Now they confronted an unimagined, stupendous choice, whether to lunge eastward toward Hawaii or southward into Australia. They tried both. The eastward drive was turned back at Midway. Down under was another matter. As early as February 1942, an armada of 243 carrier-borne Japanese planes had demolished the Australian port of Darwin. The next Japanese step would be to acquire enough island airstrips to throw up an umbrella covering massive landings on the heavily populated southeastern coast of Australia. The diggers were desperate. Having underestimated the Nipponese before Pearl Harbour, they now swung the other way. To the average Australian, glued to his Philips radio and listening to reports that enemy hordes were coming closer and closer, the Japanese looked invincible. MacArthur was in Melbourne because Australian Prime Minister John Curtin had asked Franklin Delano Roosevelt for a symbol of United States commitment to protect his country. There, and in New Zealand, Terrifying posters showed a bestial, snarling Japanese soldier hurtling across the sea, the rising sun at his back, and in one hand a crumpled map of Australia. Across the poster was printed, The word now is must. The chances that it could be done seemed slight. Never had a nation been more naked to aggression. Apart from seven Wiraways, training planes resembling Piper Cubs, its defensive air force, Kitty Hawks and Gypsy Moths, with fabric-covered wings and wooden propellers that could be started only by spinning them by hand, had been almost annihilated by zeros over Malaya. Defending infantry were middle-aged men carrying .303 bolt-action, single-shot rifles, with magazines holding five cartridges, originally issued during the Boer War. Primitive machine guns resembled 19th-century Gatling guns, and where the Japanese were expected, there were two old naval six-inch guns, and three obsolete three-inch guns. Except for one brigade of the 6th Division, crack Anzac troops were still in the Middle East. These veterans of Greece, Crete and North Africa were frantically boarding transports and would soon be homeward bound, but the Japanese were much closer. The crisis would have to be resolved without them. MacArthur found the Australian government crippled by defeatism. In Melbourne, its generals were wedded to what they called the Brisbane Line, which would be fixed along the Tropic of Capricorn, actually just above Brisbane. Beyond the line, the great western and northern regions of the continent would be sacrificed. Plans had been drawn up to scorch the earth there, destroying military installations, blowing up power plants and burning docks. This would have left the Australians with the settled southern and eastern coasts, but MacArthur correctly guessed that the southeast was precisely where the Japanese intended to come ashore. He again threatened to resign his commission unless the concept of the Brisbane Line was scrapped. Prime Minister Curtin yielded, but his people despaired, believing that the last hope of saving their homes had been lost. 
Before the invasion, the Nipponese needed to sever Australia's supply lines to the United States and build a staging area. To achieve the first, they were building airfields in the Solomon Islands. The staging area would be New Guinea's Port Moresby, 300 miles from the Australian coast. The Battle of the Coral Sea, actually fought on the Solomon Sea, had turned back the Japanese fleet, which had been ordered to capture Moresby by sea. Then the Japanese seized a beachhead at Milne Bay, halfway to their objective. MacArthur pored over maps and decided that Moresby would be the key to the campaign. He said, Australia will be defended in New Guinea and we must attack, attack, attack. But where? In the tangled, uncharted equatorial terrain, the two suffering armies could only grope blindly toward each other. Some offshore isles were literally uninhabitable. United States engineers sent to survey the Santa Cruz group were virtually wiped out by cerebral malaria, and subsequent battles were fought under fantastic conditions. One island was rocked by earthquakes. Volcanic steam hissed through the rocks of another. On a third, bulldozers vanished in spongy, bottomless swamps. Sometimes the weather was worse than the enemy. At Cape Gloucester, 16 inches of rain fell in a single day and sea engagements were broken off because neither the Japanese nor the American admirals knew where the bottom was. The Allies were slow to comprehend the Solomon's threat, but by the late spring of 1942 they had brought New Guinea into full focus, the world's second largest island, second to Greenland. New Guinea stretches across the waters north of the Australian continent like a huge 1,500-mile-long buzzard. As you face the map, the head is toward the left, southeast of the Philippines. The tail, to the right, at about the same degree of latitude as Guadalcanal in the Solomons, is the Papuan Peninsula. Both armies had come to realise that whoever held this peninsula would command the northern approaches to Australia. In taking Milne Bay, the enemy had nipped the tip of the tail. That troubled MacArthur, but did not alarm him. He could count on the Australians to dislodge them. The threat was not immediate. Meanwhile, however, another Japanese force had anchored off Buna and Gona, villages on Papua's upper or northern side. Their purpose was obscure. Between Buna and Gona on the north and Port Moresby on the south loomed Papua's blunt, razor-backed Owen Stanley Range, the Rockies of the Pacific, rising tier on limestone tier, its caps carrying snow almost to the equator and its lower ridges so densely forested that some spurs resembled paintings by Piero della Francesca. To send an army over these forbidding mountains, upon which more than 300 inches of rain falls each year, was regarded as absolutely impossible. MacArthur sent two of his ablest officers to Moresby, directing them to study its defences. They came back full of assurances. The city was surrounded by water and impenetrable rainforest, they said. They omitted one detail. Either because they had not seen it or because they regarded it as insignificant, they failed to mention a little track that meandered off into the bush in the general direction of the Owen Stanleys. Soon the world would know that winding path as the Kokoda Trail. Anyone trying to grasp the nature of the fighting which now lay ahead must first come to grips with its appalling battlefields and the immensity of the Pacific Ocean. The first task is difficult, the second almost impossible. It is a striking fact that you could drop the entire landmass of the earth into the Pacific and still leave a vast sea shroud to roll in Melville's words as it rolled 5,000 years ago. Geographers usually divide Oceania into three parts, Melanesia, Micronesia and Polynesia, but these terms are confusing and largely irrelevant to the campaigns of World War II. The foci of actions in 1942 were New Guinea, the Solomons to the east, and between them, the Bismarck Archipelago, whose two chief islands, New Britain and New Ireland, resemble the letter F inverted and on its back, with New Britain as the shank and New Ireland as the hook. In the Allied Grand Strategy, the Pacific would ultimately be divided into two theatres of war. On the left, MacArthur would drive through New Guinea to the Philippines. Meanwhile, Chester Nimitz and his fellow admirals, having stopped the Japanese in the Solomons, would lunge across the central Pacific, hopping over a chain of islands, Tarawa, the Marianas, Iwo Jima to Okinawa. At that point, the twin offensives would merge. Okinawa would be the base for an American invasion of the Japanese home islands, with Nimitz commanding the fleet and MacArthur sending the GIs and Marines ashore. 
None of this, however, was envisaged in that first desperate year of the war. The geography must be mastered first. 